right, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Okay? Everybody all right? All right, good. Good. We, um, uh, there's, there's quite a few people around uh, that, are, that are under the weather. Keep them in your prayers. Uh, my wife is one included. Uh, she's really, really got hit hard by this thing. So we appreciate your prayers and, and for all those who are, who are sick in this glorious season <laughs> of sickness. Yeah, it's fun. Um, well, we are uh, we're finishing up a series today, a series on Nehemiah uh, called Living a C3 Life. And um, I, I knew it was going to be a challenging season for us. I, I had no idea how challenging it was going to be. Um, I, I certainly have no intention to whine to you, but I also want to be honest with you. Um, and and I, I, I want you to, uh, to know that, 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 there, uh, that the transition that God has, put, has led us to has, uh, has presented its share of challenges. Um, and, and so it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a difficult season. And I have... Um, I have uh, felt the, the, the battle. <laughs> it could be the greatest understatement that I've said in a long time, but um, that's, that's where we are. And, and I, I just I want to, what, what's encouraging, there's a lot of encouraging things along with this, uh, this battle, this challenge that's happened, and, and that is um, one, of, one of the greatest encouragements is that <clears throat> is that I believe God led, led us to, uh, to do this series long before we started it um, and, and uh, led us to outline the, the sermons that would, that would come each week uh, long before and, and where they would come from, um, what portions of the book of Nehemiah they would come from. What I, what I didn't know is that uh, in so many ways, uh, the what we what we were preaching and teaching and and looking at uh, in in those passages would be very um, would be very reflective of what we were going through as a as a church and and throughout this uh, whole process what's I, I, I said that that's been encouraging to me because. What that, what that tells me uh, is, that, is that God already knew. He's not surprised. And that's one of the great encouragements of my life, is that God is never surprised. Do you, do you get that? Like, when you run into a problem, when you run into uh, uh, something that happens, um, and, and you're, like, blown away by it, trust me on this. God is not sitting up there in heaven saying, Whew. I didn't see that coming. Sorry about that one. I kind of missed the, you know, that's not the kind of God we serve. The God we serve is the God that knows all things. He is in control of all things. He is over. He is sovereign in all things. And so all the, all the challenges that we face are, are challenges that he saw coming, that he knows are coming, and that he has a purpose for. And when we know that he, that he has a purpose for it, it makes it a lot easier to go through, even as difficult as it can be uh, to, to deal with. And, and so it's been a great encouragement to me every week as we've gone through and sat down to just kind of work out the details of the sermon uh, with whoever's preaching in, in Lancaster, whoever's preaching here, uh, to, to just kind of work through that. It's just been, it's just been like God has, uh, we, we've opened up the Bible and the Bible has just begun to live in front of us and, and, and God is saying, look, here's what I've done before and here's what I will do again. And, and, and here's the, the reason I'm so encouraged by that and why I'm so thankful for that is that this is the last week of this series, number one. <laughs> and we're in Nehemiah chapter 6 where the wall gets built. 
and the wall is finished. And, and, and I'm just believing that God has led us to this moment um, to, to encourage us and to remind us of who we are and what our heritage is, where we come from. And listen, in a spiritual way, we are all descendants of great men like Nehemiah who was willing to, to take what God told them to do and do it in face of tremendous challenge. And so uh, that's who we are. We are men and women of God who are pursuing God's will, focusing on God's purposes, accomplishing God's mission. And that's what uh, we have to stay focused on all through. And, and what I've tried to focus on uh, each, each week when we come together is just the, the, the reason that we're here, our purpose statement, our mission statement, that Connection Christian Church is building God's family together by helping people connect with God, connect with others, and connect in ministry. Listen, that is not just some little cute slogan. This is something that has grown out of years and years and years of prayer and conversation and work and service by so many in the congregation and, and so many who have gone before us. And, and, it, has, and it has developed. And, it, and, and then when we look back to books like Nehemiah and we see that that was God's plan and purpose for them all along and that we are just carrying on that, that, same, that same mission, that same purpose. We call this living the C3 life, connecting with three things, God, others, and in ministry. And as we live out this C3 life, it's important that we stay focused on what that is. So today I want to talk to you about this. This is a great work. This is a great work. In, in, in Nehemiah chapter 6, we're going to see the verse here in a few minutes where this comes from. But I want you to understand that I believe to the core of my soul that God, has, that God led us to preach these, this story, these words, this, these events, right now, in this moment. I believe that God had this pre-planned before the beginning of time. That he knew where we were going to be and he knew what we were going to be going through and what we would be dealing with and what we would be challenged with and what opportunities would lie in front of us. And here's what I have to say. This is a great work. I believe that to the core of my soul. I have fought for this great work, for this ministry for over 18 years now, and I will continue until God takes me out of it. I will continue to fight for this ministry and this mission that God has brought us to because this is a great work and we cannot shrink back. So the point that I want to get to when we, carry, when we are carrying out the ministry God has called us to, we must keep on keeping on. I know that sounds, I'm not sure what that sounds like to you, but I'll tell you where we got it. We got it from our founding elder, Gary Jenkins. You've probably heard it many other places, but how many of you know once you hear one person say something, enough times you start attributing it to them, even though it might have been said billions of times before that I say that because when Gary come when, I, when when I've through the years been faced with any challenge with any difficulty with with with, with things that with mountains that I just couldn't see uh, getting over Gary's advice to me was Pete <laughs> keep on keeping on just keep on keeping on. God will get it. God's got it. Just keep on keeping on. And I got to tell you that those words have meant so much to me through the years. It meant so much to me when I have been misunderstood, when I have been not clear with the vision when I have stumbled and fallen on my face, when, when I have been hated, when there have been those who have tried to destroy my career in ministry, I 
have lived according to those words that Gary gave me because I believe that God gave me Gary. I believe that a long time ago when I was a very young soldier and God called me to be a preacher and I was wondering what on earth are you thinking? He brought me to this man, this seasoned veteran, and he linked us together. And Gary became a spiritual father to me. And because of that, His words always have carried extraordinary weight in my life. And his words have kept me from doing things that I know I would have regretted if I had done them. In my youthful zeal that I know I'm not that youthful anymore, but back then I was (laughs) a little bit. Gary would say, Pete. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. This too shall pass. Keep on keeping on. And it's those words that have, that have kept me focused on the mission at hand. That have kept me focused on God's will and his glory. And it's helped me to overcome many challenges. Any good work that you do is going to be faced with its challenges. There's a reason for that because when you start doing a good work, there's an enemy that wants to stop that good work. And, And that enemy will use anything and everything he can to interrupt you and to disrupt you and to throw you off course and to confuse you and to create chaos and to lie to you and get you to believe those lies and whatever else he might try to use. It's nothing new. It's the same thing he did back in the garden. We've talked through all the way through. I've never looked at the, at the book of Nehemiah the way I have in this series, that it is an absolute perfect picture of the spiritual battle and warfare that we live in right now today it is a perfect picture of the challenge that we have facing us because the enemy wants us to fail he does not want to see us accomplish what God has called us to. He does not want to see us uh, step in and be able to uh, save something that he thought he had killed. That's what I believe about the Lancaster campus. I, I believe that the enemy thought he was about to raise his flag on that hill. And he was about to go over there and claim victory in that place. And God had a completely different plan. And he used this church, he used us, our congregation, to change that, to make that difference, to step in. And listen, he's not been happy about it. And he's tried to come at us in every way that he can think of, it seems like. Maybe I shouldn't say that. He might think of another one, but I don't care. I'm not afraid of him. My God wins. I read the last chapter of the book already. I skipped to the end. Listen, there's going, to be, there's going to be challenges with resources. There's going to be challenges with t- enough time to do what we're called to do. There's going to be challenges with people. We're all just people. We're, none of us are perfect. We're all just trying to do the best we can with what we know. And, and this is where I think that we have to keep in mind, and I have to, I I remind myself daily, flow through you what God gave to you. Flow through you what God gave to you. Because if I don't, then I will start flowing through me some stuff that God didn't give to me, but some stuff that I inherited from my own old sin nature. Some taking things in matters into my own hands. Some anger and some bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness and and slander and gossip. That's what I will allow to flow through me if I don't remind myself continuously. Don't, Don't flow that stuff. Flow through you what God gave to you. 
Because it's only when we are flowing through us love and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and grace and mercy and compassion that God had to show to me a sinner. While I was still yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I had done nothing to earn it, nothing to deserve it. I had no credit to my name. And he did it anyway. And if I can just flow that through me to others, then God will be glorified. And that's my desire. That's what I hope to do. That's what I attempt to do every day. The key to accomplishing any good work is perseverance. It doesn't take a leader to run away from a problem or to quit when things get tough. It takes a leader to lean into a problem, but to lean into that problem with grace and mercy and love as your motivation. And to lean into a challenge and a situation with grace and love as your motivation. It is simply God's will that there be peace on earth. We have an enemy who wants to disrupt that peace. But we have a Holy Spirit who says, I will produce through you peace. I will produce in you peace. If you will allow me, if you will abide in me, and my words abide in you, then the fruit of the Spirit will abide in us. It will be produced through us. Not because we try or toil or, or, or try to squeeze it out somehow, but simply because that's what God does when we allow Him to live through us. It means that pride has to be set aside and humility has to be our paramount posture. This is not easy for us. It's not easy for me. I, I, listen, if, if there's anybody around that wants to be right, I want to be right. Right? I, 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 will, I, don't, I want to be right. I confess that to you that I like being right. But I can't let being right become a point of pride that, that hinders me from allowing God's peace to be passed through me. That allows God's love and joy to be produced in me. Because that's more important to me than being right. I'm not... Leaders lean in to problems. They don't shrink back. Hebrews 10, 36 through 39 says this, You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but, by, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. But we are those who have faith and are saved. Those are powerful words. We are those who have faith and are saved. We do not shrink back. We do not cower in fear, but rather we lean in to the issue. We lean in to the problem, not in a bully kind of way, but in a, in a gracious kind of way to say, I, kind of like, instead of, there's two ways to look at leaning in, right? You, you can either lean in with your fists up, or you can lean in with your arms out. And I believe that Jesus calls us to lean in with our arms out. To lean in with open arms, open hands, open hearts, open minds to say, Lord, you be glorified. Why? Because he puts it in perspective here when he says, in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Listen, how many of you know that, that when that happens, I don't care what our issue is. 
I don't care what it is that's got us wound up tight. I don't care what kind of problems is coming uh, down at us or what kind of preferences we have that are not being met or what kind of misunderstandings we have. Listen, when he comes, all of those things are going to burn up like chaff. Poof. They're all going to be gone. It's not going to matter in the light of the coming of the glorious one. He says, in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Listen, if we could keep our eyes focused on Jesus, if we could keep our eyes expectant on the one who is coming, I'm just... I'm just encouraging me right now. You can join in any way you want to, but I'm just, I'm just encouraging me. Dude. That's me. Dude. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep expecting him to come back any minute now. He will not delay. For a little while he tarries that we might be able to reach a few That we might be able to lift up his name. That we might be able to glorify him through our life of reflecting who he is to a world that needs him so badly. But he will not delay. And when he comes, all these things will pass away. And nothing will matter except him. Listen, we get to live that way now. Nehemiah did not shrink back. He knew his mission and he knew his calling and he was committed to seeing it through. We will see his resolve and the resolve we are to have for God's calling in our own lives in our passage today. Today we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 6. It begins this way. When word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, the Geshem, and the Arab, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of the enemies that I had that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to this point I had not set the doors of the gates. Sambalat and Geshem sent a message to me: "Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the path of on, on the plain of Ono." Just a hint, don't ever go anywhere called Ono. Oh <laughs> Just saying. It's not a good. But, but they were scheming to harm him. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it to go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. I, want to, I just want to talk to you a little bit about vision. When you know the ministry you are called to, and you have a vision, for, and you have a vision from God for the ministry, for that ministry, you know what to consistently say no to. Nehemiah was asked four times by these powerful governors to come down and meet. He could have thought of himself as having a seat at the table finally. He could have thought of himself as being in the mix of of other powerful leaders in the area. But rather, he stayed focused on the mission. He stayed focused on the vision that God had given him to build the wall. And he consistently said no to it. You see, vision creates clarity. Vision creates clarity. Helen Keller once said that the only thing worse than being blind is having sight, but no vision. I believe that. I believe that to the core of my soul. Because there was a time many, many years ago where I found myself in a situation responsible for something that I did not have a vision for. 
that I had not yet been given a vision for. And, and, and we spent a, a considerable season as elders and leaders uh, praying for and seeking out God's vision and God's work. This, this past week, I went back to those old papers. <laughs> I went back to those old days and I, and I dug those out and I, and I began to read them again. And I began to see how things that we saw then with, with our spiritual eyes, we get to see now with our natural eyes because they have come to pass. Back then, we had no dream. We, we had no idea how God was going to do what God has done. We had no inkling of what God was going to accomplish but he began to show it to us. He began to reveal it to us. And, and, and in, our, in our hearts, we began to write these things down and to see what, and, and, and to see what God was about to do. And I, I, just, I, I brought a couple of them with me just to share with you. In, in years past, I, there, there was a time when, honestly, I mean, how many of you know that when, when God opens your eyes and shows you something, that's really all you want to talk about? Has that ever happened to you? I hope it has. I hope it will. I hope it continues to. But when, when God opens your eyes and shows you something, it's like literally the only thing you want to talk about. And there was, if you went back to the recordings of, of sermons that I did those many years ago, you would have thought that I just preached the same sermon over and over again in slightly different ways because I, I, that's all I talked about was the vision. The vision that God had given us of what kind of church we wanted to be, of what kind of church he created us to be, he was building us to be. And, and all these words came out of that time frame. But, but what I've come, what, I, where, what I've become aware of is that somewhere along that line, I stopped preaching about the vision. And... And Bill Heibel says it this way. He says, vision leaks. you gotta keep, you got to keep pouring. And, and over time, when we lose our vision, when we get confused on the vision, when we get uh, away from the vision, we are, uh, we are destined to run off course. And, and so I, 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 I looked at, I, I looked back, and I re recalled sermon after sermon after sermon that we talked about this in meeting after meeting and gathering after gathering and anywhere that anyone that would sit down and talk to me about it I would I would just talk about the vision and where God was leading us building God's family together were the were the linchpin words that came together in that time frame we look we think of them now today as just like yeah that's the cute little slogan we have no listen <laughs> Those few words changed our lives. Those words changed everything. Those words shifted the, the direction of who we were as a ministry. When, when God revealed to us that our, that our focus uh, as a ministry was to be to young families with children and teens... That changed everything. It changed the way we did children's ministry. It changed the way we did youth ministry. It changed the way we did worship style. It changed everything we did. It changed the, the, the services that we had. It, it, it shifted everything. And it was that vision that defined us as who we are and that we still pursue. Back then... I wrote down that we envision what was then York Christian Church as a community of believers who are committed to reaching thousands of people in the York area and the world through sending and supporting missionaries with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you know at that moment we, we didn't have any money? We barely had a building, and, and, we, and, and every month we would wonder whether or not we were actually going to be able to pay the bills. 
uh, much less payroll, you know. Uh, there, there was a time that I took a pay cut just so we could keep going. We had no idea that, at some, that someday, that one day, we would be able to send our own missionaries from this congregation, primary, being their primary support into a country uh, in, in South America where, where they could spread the gospel and accomplish the work. We had no idea that that could happen. We, we had no idea that we would not only send one couple, but we would send two. We had no idea that we would not only, uh, that, that we would not only support missionaries, but that we would send short-term missionaries uh, multiple times per year to go and to do the work of the gospel. We had no idea how that was going to look, what that was going to uh, be. We envision your Christian church as a haven, an outpost, if you will, where battered and bruised people can find rest and, and acceptance and where Christian soldiers can come for encouragement and empowerment and energy. We had no idea. We were like 40 people. We had no idea how we could do that. We had no idea that we would have ministries like Celebrate Recovery, where people would gather on Friday nights, hurts, hang-ups, and habits would be healed, and people would be delivered and set free from those things because God would gather a people to himself and raise up the name of Jesus, and, and lives would change. We had no idea what that was going to look like. But this is what happens when you have a vision and you can begin to see what's not there. You don't have to know how. You just know what. Right? When God gives you a vision, he doesn't tell you how. He doesn't give you all the how you're going to get there. He just tells you what it's going to look like when you get there. I could go on and on. A vision... A clear vision will keep you on track when everything else is trying to get you off track. And listen, as distractible as I am, <laughs> like, oh, look at bird. You know, I, that's how I am. I, I am distractible. I am easily taken off course. But the vision keeps me focused. It is the vision that keeps me focused. It is what God has called us to as a church and as a body and as a family that keeps me focused. If it weren't for that, I don't know where I would be, stuck in a cornfield somewhere. A clear vision gives pain a purpose. I had never heard that before, and yesterday I was just searching for something. I was looking for something for God to to speak to me about through and 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 I just happened to just a coincidence I just happened to hit a podcast that was exactly what I was thinking about because God does those things for me from time to time something that that guy said he said if you have a clear vision then your pain has purpose Clear vision gives pain a purpose. When we know where we're going, when we know where we're headed, when we know that it is God's direction and God's will, then all of the pain to get there makes it, that makes all of the pain to get there worth it. Because we know that all that challenge, that all that struggle, that all that confusion and working through and keeping on, keeping on and, and continuing to press in and to, to not quit, but to work together and come together, leaning in with open arms and not clenched fists, we will find our way. And we will end up stronger when we get there than we were when we started out, if we will come at it with the right attitude and in the way Jesus did it. You see, Jesus could have come at us with clenched fists, right? I mean, obviously, 
we didn't agree with him, and he didn't agree with us. And, and he could have come at us the way we were coming at him with rejection and anger and bitterness and, and clenched fists, but he rather leaned in with open arms and open hands to be nailed to a cross on our behalf. And he won. <laughs> You see, I also believe that. I also believe that when we lean in to a challenge, when we lean into a problem, when we lean into a difficulty in our lives with open hands and open arms, open hearts and open minds, we will win. Verse 5 says, Then... The fifth time, Sam Ballad sent his aid to me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written. It is reported among the nations, the Geshem says it's true, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, According to those reports, you are about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you, uh, about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. <laughs> Here's Nehemiah's reply. So I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. <laughs> Don't you love that? <laughs> Nothing like what you are saying is actually happening. You're making it up out of your head. Sometimes you just have to help people see the truth. And listen, the devil would like nothing more than to distort the truth. Because if he can distort the truth and get us to believe a lie, if he can get us to believe a lie and start to write our own narrative in our minds about what's happening based on that lie, how many of you know he can run us, everyone, myself very much included, off in the ditch? I can start to believe that every one of you hate my guts and want nothing but my head on a stick. And if I continue to believe that, and I continue to write my own narrative about it, how effective do you think I'm going to be in accomplishing God's mission that he's called me to? Not very. But see, I know that's not true. I know that's not true. And I can't let the enemy distort me on that and if I think that's true listen I'm going to come to you and ask you do you hate me because I need to know the truth before I start writing my own narrative before I start writing and creating my own story because our own stories listen they're contaminated our own stories are contaminated with the lies and you have to seek out the truth you have to be willing to go to people and say, here's unfortunately what I'm thinking. Please set me straight. Let's talk about this. Let's bring it out into the light as he is in the light. Because there, the devil has no foothold. Out in the light where there is truth, the devil cannot stand because he cannot stand in the light. He is the author of lies. Jesus said, when he lies, he speaks his native language. So we have to bring it out in the light. Verse 9 says, they were, all trying, <laughs> they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed. Everybody say that with me. But I prayed. But I prayed is the way that we deal with problems. 
It's the way that you deal with challenges. It's the way you deal with life. It's the way you deal with the wonderful things that happen in your life and the terrible things that happen in your life. But I prayed. But I prayed. And this is what he prayed. Now strengthen my hands. <laughs> Don't you love that? Now strengthen my hands. Just give me strength, Lord. That's what I need, the strength of the Lord. And But I prayed. Nothing combats fear like the prayer of faith. Fear and faith cannot coexist. They cannot live together. They do not work. They're, they are polar opposites. When the enemy tries to get us to live by fear, we start, to, we, we start becoming territorial. We, we start to fight for our own little piece of land, our own little piece of, uh, of, of whatever that we have, our own little control. I, I, drew, I do this. I'm just telling you what I know because I do this. When I start to live by fear, I, I start to be suspicious of everyone around me. I start to dream up uh, fallacies that everyone around me has some kind of uh, agenda against me or some kind of way that they're trying, there's some kind of conspiracy. I could become some weirdo locked in a hotel room with stuff pinned to the walls. Do you know what I'm talking about? I have that potential in me. To become that paranoid and that frantic if I were to allow fear to overcome and dominate me. But I choose faith. I choose to believe that my God is in control, that my God is in charge, that he has called us to this good work, that he has called us here to do this great thing for him, to accomplish great things for the kingdom, and to see his name glorified and lifted up among all men. That's what I believe that he has called us to. And if we are willing, if I am willing to humble myself under the mighty hand of God and say, God, I will not lash out in fear. I will not lash out because I'm afraid of what someone is going to do to me or do to my career or do to my church or do to the ministry. I am not going to lash out, Lord. I am going to lean in. I'm going to lean in in the way that you have called me to lean in. Verse 10 says, one day I went to the house of Shemiah, I guess, son of Delia, the son of that guy, and <laughs> who was shut in at his home. This is a shut-in he's visiting. And he said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the door, uh, the temple doors because men are coming to kill you by night and they are, call, and they are coming <laughs> because men are coming to kill you by night they are coming to kill you. This is Nehemiah visiting someone who is shut in in their house. This is presumably a friend, a, a, someone that he knows. He, he even tells the, the lineage of this person. I knew your daddy and your granddaddy, right? And now I'm going to visit your granddaddy. <laughs> and what do they do? They tell him, go run and hide in fear. Go run and hide in fear. You see, we, we have to be willing to live by discernment because sometimes the attacks come from those you least expect. And honestly, they sting a little harder when they do. But Nehemiah knew that this wasn't of God. Why? Because he had a vision. Because he knew his mission. Because he knew his purpose and he knew his motive and he knew his heart. He knew that his heart was pure. And so, he says in verse 11, But I said, 
Should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalad had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Just talking to me again here. But I have to stay plugged in to the things of God so that I can discern, so that I can know. Nehemiah prays. You've got to love Nehemiah's prayers. <laughs> he says, remember Tobiah and Sembalad, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noadia and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elu in 52 days. What does Sam Ballard do? He doesn't, he doesn't tell God what to do. He just simply reminds God of his enemy. And you know, I, I, I want you to understand this. When I talk about the enemy, I am not talking about a single person in, on the planet. Because my battle is not against flesh and blood. My battle is against the principalities and powers of this dark world. When we pray against the enemy, we pray against the enemy. Right? We pray against the one who is trying to shut down our mission. We pray against the one who is trying to shut down our families, who is trying to disrupt what God is doing in our lives. He's trying to hinder us and keep us from accomplishing the good work that he has called us to, this great project that he has called us to. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not big on this, the new translation where it's, it's called the Great Project. I, I like the old King James version of this one. And there are a lot of old King James versions that I still, that I just like because I just like what they meant to me a long time ago. And, and in the King James version, in that verse, he says, I am doing a good work. That word, those two words together, a good work. It's not, about, it's not about one moment. It's about living a life that is focused on the mission, focused on what God has called us to. So prayer is our most powerful weapon to be used against the enemy. Listen, we don't use prayer against each other. We use prayer against the enemy that is trying to confuse us, trying to distort us, trying to get us to believe lies. We pray against the enemy. We raise up prayers against the enemy. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. He says this in verse 3, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against, us, against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Do you see what he's saying there? He says, we're not fighting against brothers and sisters in the world. We are fighting against divine powers. We're fighting against powers that, that are beyond what we can see with our natural eyes. And it's those powers that are going to try to get in our heads. That are going to try to set up 
strongholds in our minds, anger and resentment and bitterness and pretension against each other so that he can get a stronghold. But the Bible says that here, the weapons we fight against are divine weapons that, can, that have the divine power to demolish these strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? It's one word. Truth. That's what it is. It's truth. How many of you know this? God does not believe one single lie anywhere ever. Why? Because He is only truth. He sees all. He knows all. There is no lie in Him. He is not like a man that He should lie. He cannot. He only sees truth. And that knowledge of God is the truth that sets us free from the arguments and the strongholds that the enemy tries so hard to build up against us. We are doing a good work. We are accomplishing a great thing for the Lord. Does that mean that everything that we're doing is absolutely right and absolutely perfect and, and every decision is exactly uh, what it should be every single time? Psh, no. I wish that would make my life easier. But I do know this. I do know that our motives are pure. Our desires are to glorify God and make his name known to all. I do know that in the pursuit of accomplishing this vision, we will make adjustments. We will have to make course changes. We will make mistakes. But in the end, God will be glorified. And people will come to know Christ because the gospel will be spread. Nehemiah 6.16 says this. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. <laughs> oh, that's why I'm glad this series is ending right there. Because I believe God's just been writing our story. When the enemy realizes that God is doing a good work in your life, and that you are going to keep on keeping on, the enemy becomes demoralized. Listen, if we will persevere, if we will lean in with open hands and open hearts, God will be glorified. Don't let him get in our heads. I, I include me in that. Don't let him get in our heads. Because I'm going to tell you now, he, he fights hard to get in this little pea brain of mine. All the time, every single day. Protect us from the lies. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and glorify you and we worship you and we honor you. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would continue this good work that you have begun. Lord, I pray that you would lead us to be good leaders, to be clear, to be determined persevere. Lord, I pray that you would help us to stay focused on the goal, stay focused on the vision that you have given us for the sake and the good of those around us so that the gospel will be spread so that your name will be lifted high. And Lord, we just ask that in all things that we would just be able to Humbly lean in. We thank you, Jesus, for being our example. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.